The word laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. To understand how a laser works, you first have to understand the concept of stimulated emission. If an electron in an atom gains a discrete or quantized amount of energy, then it will jump up to a higher energy level and become excited. This is an unstable state to be in, so the electron will spontaneously jump back down to the lowest energy level possible, or ground state. The atom is de-excited and returned to the energy it was before. Energy is always conserved, so as the electron jumps down, a photon is emitted of the same energy as the difference between the two energy levels. This is known as spontaneous emission. In a laser, a photon of specific wavelength travels past the electron of an excited atom, stimulating the electron to jump down from the higher to lower energy level. This emits a photon of the same wavelength as the original incident photon, in order to conserve energy. Both photons therefore have the same wavelength due to E equals HC over wavelength. This is known as stimulated emission. Lasers use this effect to produce coherent light. Some of the most powerful lasers in the UK are found at the Central Laser Facility in the Rutherford Appleton Laboratory, Oxfordshire. The most famous of these is the Vulcan laser. Stimulated emission is created in the Vulcan by flashlights firing on a neodymium glass rod. Multiple rods are lined up in chains to amplify the light pulse, and groups of these chains amplify it to 10,000 times the power of the national grid. To amplify the pulse to this high level, the light beam is stretched in time amplified and then recompressed before hitting its target. This is known as chirped pulse amplification. The stretch in time is achieved by diffracting the light beam into its spectrum of wavelengths. Red travels the shortest distance and blue travels the longer distance, so that when they reconverge, the resulting light beam is longer than the original. The effect is reversed at the other end by diffracting the light beam again and correcting it before incidence on the target. Scientists have managed to shorten the pulse to only 220 femtoseconds using this technique. At the target, the pulse superheats the surface to around 1 million degrees, but to a depth of less than 100 nanometers. This is around 170 times hotter than the surface of the sun and reaches plasma state. Pressure causes the plasma to expand hydrodynamically as in a violent explosion. However, the heating period is much shorter than the time needed for significant hydrodynamic expansion, as the material is heated to a plasma state in a few picoseconds. So during this period, there is no increase in volume. Enormous pressure is created, and the momentum of the photons from the laser actually crushes the sample due to sheer numbers, increasing the temperature and pressure further. Side note, photons have momentum despite mass equaling zero, because E equals hc over lambda, so they must have energy, and therefore momentum, due to this second equation. Then, of course, the plasma expands rapidly, emitting large amounts of radiation. Firing the laser at a thin foil accelerates its electrons to relativistic speeds. These emerge from the foil's rear surface, creating a large negative cloud of charge. Billions of protons from the foil accelerate past the cloud as a beam. The laser and foil combination could be used to fire protons into water. When you do this, molecules are ionized and the protons lose speed. When they finally slow to a halt, a final burst of energy is released, called a Bragg peak. Humans consist mainly of water, and therefore this effect can be used to target tumours in cancer therapy. X-rays, on the other hand, travel at a constant speed, and release most energy at the point of entrance. Protons destroy tumours in the same way X-rays do, but cause much less damage to surrounding tissue. They can be used to treat tumours close to critical organs, with fewer side effects and delivering a much lower dose of radiation. We can also treat cancer patients with a full course of conventional radiation and still be able to offer proton therapy as a last resort, despite their quota of x-rays being used up. Proton therapy might seem the perfect solution. However, current methods cost in excess of $100 million. Developing this method could produce a cheaper and more accessible cure for cancer. To find out more, look at your handout.